Is this haunted chair really responsible for the deaths of 63 people? Come and sit by me as we get into the curse of the Busby Stoop chair, the story of a brutal 18th century murder and the terrifying paranormal aftermath. Hey friend, how has your day been today? Are you doing good? Are you staying hydrated? If you're new around here, hello, hi, welcome. I'm Claire and I'm a lover of all things morbid, mysterious and macabre. I have spent hours and hours absolutely enthralled in ghost hunting TV shows and paranormal YouTube investigations, but you know what I love more than night vision footage and EVPs? I love the history behind a paranormal encounter, the origins of urban legends and the raw personal ghost stories from people that have experienced them firsthand. Like, I swear that all the terrifying ones happen when you least expect it as well. I love that shit. When it happens to other people. <laughs> so that's what we're gonna do. Every week, we sit down and swap ghost stories like a good old sleepover. So if that is your scene, I would highly recommend that you subscribe so that you never miss a chat. I would hate for you to miss one of these chats. The source for this week is from a man that lived locally to the legend and literally wrote the book. His name is Mark Robinson. He literally did like all of the research and rounded up all the information available on on the chair to write the book called The Dead Man's Chair, The Legend of the Busby Stoop Chair. So we have a lot to thank Mark for as his is the first and only book which goes into detail all about like the history of the different locations and all of like the different variations that have been passed down for generations like in the local area. So it is a small but very mighty book that I would highly recommend picking up a copy. I will leave the book linked in the description below so that you can get your own copy. So let's get into it, shall we? We're going back to the late 17th century to a coaching inn situated on one of the main roads in the town of Thirsk in North Yorkshire. A particularly colourful character regularly visited this particular watering hole. His name was Thomas Busby and he was well known in the area as a drunk, a thief and generally not nice person. <laughs> When fights broke out at the inn, which funnily enough they did often, it would be a pretty good guess to assume that Busby was the initiator thanks to his quick temper. Which makes you wonder why they would keep letting him back in, but then I guess like he was probably keeping the place afloat if he was drinking there every night. And the area was standard for rural England, like especially at that time, like Thirsk was a market town surrounded by farmland and it had like a really close knit community. You know where one of those places where everyone knows everyone one, which isn't much different from villages in England now. If you don't know what I mean, like the best representation that I've seen of this is the village out of Hot Fuzz. Like it's very much like everyone knows everyone's business because it's for the greater good. But it was remote and it was away from the major cities, so there was some degree of privacy, which is exactly what a man named Daniel Orty was looking for. He had just moved from Leeds with his daughter Elizabeth and he was what was known as a coin clipper. So back in the 17th century, coins were made by hand. The precious metal was melted and beaten into like a sheet where discs of metal were cut out with shears, like scissors. And the designs on the coins were then like hammered onto the blank coins using something called a pile and a trussel. And the thing about handmade coins was that the metal that they were made out of was like kind of the whole point of the currency. So to make one silver penny, you would need the equivalent amount of one penny's worth of silver metal to like make up the value. So coin clippers would take advantage of this and would basically like clip some of the silver off from like round the edges of the coins because like they're handmade, they're hand cut out, they're not even. And sometimes like the designs might not reach to the edge of the coin. They might be like stretched out or whatever. So you could just like clip off the excess and no one would know, right? Over time, the coin clipper would save these little offcuts, melt them down into bullion to either sell or forge their own coins. However, the problem with this is that by clipping off some of the excess around the design is that you're taking metal away from the penny. So it now weighs less. It's not actually a penny's worth of silver anymore. So Daniel Orty moved into a farmhouse just up the road from the coaching inn and he renamed it Danity Hall. And this place was 
was like perfect for a forger like Daniel as it was situated on the top of a gentle hill so he could see anyone that was approaching and it was pretty secluded so like he wasn't going to be disturbed by noisy neighbours. And this guy was like a next level professional crook. Like he was dedicated to his craft. He apparently even went so far as to build like an underground tunnel that led to a secret room which was where he could have some privacy while he was clipping and forging his coins. And I mean, in this line of work, the stakes are high. If you were caught clipping or counterfeiting coins, like it was game over, you'd get executed for that. So Daniel never let anyone in on like his secret business. Like no one knew what type of shady he was sort of into. However, Daniel's daughter, Elizabeth, saw something in Thomas Busby and decided that she fancied a bit of that. They fell in love and soon got married and Elizabeth moved into the inn, so out of Danity Hall, to live with her new husband. At some point, Elizabeth must have told Thomas what her dad did for a living and Thomas, being the shining beacon of humanity as a nasty drunk and already a petty criminal, fit perfectly into Daniel's forgery operation. So they became friends and went into business together. But I don't think it was a match made in criminal heaven. Apparently, Daniel never really approved of his daughter's decision to marry such a low life, which I can't imagine made things very easy for the two men like working together day to day. Elizabeth like quite clearly loved her husband, but she would never replace his first love, alcohol. Because when he drank, he got violent and he loved to drink all the time. So like any loving dad, like Daniel was worried for Elizabeth. Like that's never a marriage that you want your daughter to be in, like no matter how happy she says she is. And I'm guessing that he'd probably made his opinions on their marriage like very clear to her. One night while Busby was out getting smashed somewhere else, Daniel went to the lodgings and decided that enough was enough. Like Elizabeth, you are coming home with me at once. Like I'm getting you out of here. We've had enough, no more. He wasn't leaving without his daughter. She was coming home with him. And that was it, that was the end of it. But Elizabeth was a devoted wife and refused to go with her dad until Thomas came home. She was like, no, not going anywhere. Wait until Thomas comes home and then we can all just have it out and just have all of this sorted, okay? So Daniel took a seat in somewhere he would live to regret and waited for his son-in-law to return from wherever he was out drinking. When he finally returned, Thomas was furious to see Daniel. And we don't know if it was because obviously Daniel was threatening to take his wife away or because Daniel had been sitting in his chair. I know. Daniel refused to get up out of Thomas's favorite chair. Like, dude, I'm trying to make sure you never see your wife again and you're getting angry about the chair. Really? Eventually, Daniel returned home to Danity Hall without Elizabeth, who stayed at the lodgings with Thomas. But like, this had already set Thomas off. Thomas was fuming. Like how dare this guy come into my house trying to get my wife to leave me and then have the audacity to sit in my chair. Like he was just seething, like absolutely seething. Like something had to be done. This insult would not stand. So once it had got dark, Thomas had decided what he was gonna do. He decided to pay a visit to Danity Hall. Fueled by rage and probably more than a few pints of liquid courage, Thomas grabbed one of the hammers that the men had used many times before to counterfeit money and brutally bludgeoned Daniel to death. He dumped his father-in-law's body in the nearby woods and presumably went back to the coaching inn to sleep off the rest of the alcohol. After people noticed that Daniel hadn't been seen in a few days, like they started getting a bit suspicious. It didn't take them very long to make the pretty grim discovery and Thomas's pathetic attempt at hiding the body. I mean, they already knew that he was a criminal. It was gonna be pretty obvious to everyone by that point that they were up to something shady. So it wouldn't be hard to assume that it was just like a business thing that had gone wrong. No secrets in a little rural community, remember? Thomas was taken to the York Assizes in 1702, where he was found guilty after a short trial and sentenced to death. Like, I couldn't imagine it going any other way other than that. Apparently before he was hung, he was allowed one final drink at the coaching inn in his favorite chair, which didn't help the man go quietly as he started screaming and cursing at all the people that had come to see the murdering scumbag hang. I'm guessing that the pub owners would be like quite conflicted about seeing one of their best customers get executed. Horrible guy that starts loads of fights, buys loads of booze. 
One particular curse that he screamed right before his death would go on to live in infamy. He apparently said that death shall come swiftly to anyone who dares sit in my chair which would end up becoming a terrifying reality, even hundreds of years later, which you know we're gonna get into. After he was executed, his body was cut down and coated in pitch, which was like a thicker, more solid form of tar, and then hung in a gibbet near the inn that he'd called home. Travelers into and out of the town of Thirsk would then pass Thomas's rotting, disgusting corpse hanging by the road to act as a final insult to Busby and to hopefully deter other would-be criminals from bashing their in-laws' heads in. I couldn't find any information or records that said what had happened to Elizabeth after all of this, so I do hope that she did all right for herself after losing her dad and her husband. Like, she's the only person I feel sorry for in all of this. Like, at some point after Thomas was executed, the coaching inn was renamed the Busby Stoop Inn, serving as a pretty grim reminder of the whole story because of course you'd name your pub after a brutal murderer. It was complete with a noose hanging outside the pub as well as a portrait of Thomas Busby himself inside. And I'm sure it'll come as no shock to anyone to know that this place is rumored to be incredibly haunted with some people saying that the spirit of Thomas Busby himself haunts his old home. Pretty soon after Busby was executed, the locals started claiming that they had seen him both in the pub and at the crossroads where his body was hung in the gibbet nearby. And he was said to appear with, still with the noose like hanging around his neck. And I mean, I'm not shocked. Like he was an angry man in life, clearly. He was brutally executed in a very public way and his body wasn't laid to rest like a good law abiding Christian of the time. Like, I don't know, but that sounds like a recipe for a ghost to me. A previous landlady who ran the pub for seven years experienced something very weird during her time there. She claimed that one time she saw a ghostly figure at the top of the stairs. It was very tall with no face and apparently no arms. She watched it glide sideways and disappear straight through a wall. No, no thank you. There was a time when paranormal groups could go and investigate the inn, but there wasn't really like a huge amount of information out there. Like I couldn't really find anyone's evidence or anything. So if you got the chance to investigate, like I would be super interested to hear like what you got, like if you captured anything or let me know. Apparently there was the spirit of a 15 year old girl that had been murdered in one of the bedrooms. Other people report the spirit of a man named Jack that haunts the bar area of the pub. Apparently the landlord that would host these like paranormal groups claimed that there were five ghosts that haunted the Busby Stoop Inn, but I couldn't really find anything to verify that. And I mean like this guy would have been the one that's like making money from paranormal investigators hiring out the pub for their investigations. So I'm inclined to take what he says with a pinch of salt. So remember that little old curse that Thomas Busby placed on his favorite chair? Yeah, that quickly became part of local legend with the landlord leaving Busby's chair in exactly the same place where Busby sat and drank himself to oblivion night after night. But not only was it cursed, apparently it was haunted too by the spirit of Thomas Busby himself. He must have had like a packed schedule as a ghost. He had so many places to be, like he was at the crossroads, up at the stairs, like his chair. Yeah, there's a lot to do. So people that were either incredibly brave or stupid who dared to sit in the cursed chair reported hearing disembodied voices as well as seeing written warnings on things like mirrors and walls of their impending death. And that's like, that's giving me like final destination type energy like right there. They also reported becoming paranoid, confused, and even extremely itchy after sitting in the chair. But I think that's probably more to do with like an anxiety response to knowing that you're sitting in a cursed chair that is believed to kill you if you sit in it. Like you'll be waiting for the inevitable, wondering when death is gonna finally come and collect you. I mean like, all of us really just waiting. That thought alone is enough to keep you a little on edge. It's most likely that you couldn't have visited the pub without being told the tale of Thomas Busby and his cursed chair. And yet this didn't stop people from sitting in the chair themselves. But the curse would turn out to be more than just a horror story passed down through the years. A string of mysterious deaths would eventually be connected to the chair and Thomas Busby's infamous curse. 
The first and most famous death that was connected to the chair was that of a chimney sweep in 1894. We don't really know his name or like anything about him, but we do know that he was at the Busby Stoop Inn drinking with a friend when his friend dared him to sit in the cursed chair. And this was the first time that someone had sat in the seat in decades. Like everyone knew about the curse. So like why on earth would you want to risk sitting in the chair? But this chimney sweep was not one to back down from a dare and certainly not one to believe in such superstitious nonsense. So he put his feet up and got comfy in Thomas's favourite chair. Nothing happened, no lightning came down from the sky to strike him down, no ghost of Thomas Busby came to drag him to hell, nothing happened. The evening continued on and the chimney sweep went back to enjoying his evening of drinking with his mate and they left the pub in the early hours of the morning. But he would never make it home. Turns out he really wouldn't make it that far at all. The morning after, the chimney sweep was found hanging by his neck from a gatepost near the inn. An inquest was held into his death, which ruled that he had died by suicide. Although a deathbed confession in 1914 from his drinking buddy that night allegedly revealed that the wonderful friend had actually tied him up onto the gatepost and robbed him. What a lovely person. But this was just the start for the cursed chair. In May 1943, during World War II, the Royal Air Force opened up the Skipton on Swale airfield about a mile away from the inn. It was operated by the RAF Bomber Command and housed squadrons from the Royal Canadian Air Force. So during the war, Bomber Command was responsible for like the strategic bombing of Germany's industrial infrastructure. So they played like a, a huge, like crucial part in the war but obviously it was very dangerous. Like Germany was gonna wanna try and kill these guys that were trying to blow up all their industry sort of thing. So with the pub just a few minutes walk away from the airfield, many airmen that were stationed there would drink at the Busby Stoop Inn. And it is said that of the men that dared to challenge the curse and sit in Busby's chair, none of them returned from their missions alive. Which yes, is quite weird if it is just those ones that died, but also again, very dangerous job to be in. In 1968, a new landlord would take over Busby Stoop Inn. His name was Tony Earnshaw. And while he was very well aware of the stories surrounding the chair and the pub itself, he didn't really believe it. Like, really? A cursed chair from the 1700s actually killing people? Like, Okay. So he thought nothing of it and continued to keep the chair out in the bar area because like really what harm can it do? I mean like people are coming in to see the chair so it's good for business. Like I'll keep it out. I don't care. Tony Earnshaw would eventually find out just how much he should care. His first experience of the power of the cursed chair came sometime after 1974 from what I can gather because in 1974, the Allenbrook Barracks opened up just a couple of miles away from the inn. So just like RAF Skipton on Swale, soldiers would use Busby Stoop Inn as like a place to have a few drinks and unwind. And just like the Canadian Airmen, two soldiers from Allenbrook were daring each other to sit in the infamous chair. Again, no one was struck down in the pub, but... Later that day, both soldiers were killed when their car crashed into a tree. So after hearing this, Tony Earnshaw's thinking a bit like, mm, okay, bit weird. Could have just been a coincidence though. Like not jumping to any conclusions. But the chair wasn't done. A few months later, a group of builders that were working on a nearby house came into the pub for lunch. And as lads do, they dared the young apprentice to sit in the chair. That afternoon, while working on the roof, the apprentice fell through onto the concrete below where he was instantly killed. So after this, like, Earnshaw's rattled, like, okay, maybe there is something to this curse after all. And like, he's a good dude. He doesn't want to risk any more victims. So he moves the chair into the cellar as a precaution. And it was then that he like looked into the previous tenants of the inn and he found a string of coincidences surrounding this chair. Car crashes, accidents, and heart attacks seemed like weirdly common in Thursk. And there seemed to be this link between incidents and the victim sitting in the chair only days or even hours before their death. A hitchhiker was hit by a car two days after sitting in the chair. Like numerous motorcyclists lost their lives on the bikes after leaving the pub. Apparently even an otherwise healthy 30 year old man suffered a massive heart attack and died only the day after sitting in the cursed chair. And one incident that I find like 
really sad is that a cleaner at the inn slipped over and like sort of fell into the chair. And this was apparently enough to trigger the curse as that very night she went to bed and never woke up. Apparently having suffered like a massive brain aneurysm in the night, which is really sad because like she didn't even go with the intention of sitting in the chair and yet she still died. And in 1978, a delivery driver from the brewery came to drop off the kegs into the cellar and he sat down in the chair, which was obviously now down here saying like, oh yeah, this is like very nice, very comfortable chair. Like, why isn't this upstairs? Seemingly there's nothing wrong with it. And I'm gonna guess that he was like putting the kegs down there on his own or that Earnshaw was like, what are you doing? Get the hell up off that chair. But it would turn out to be too late anyway because later that night, Earnshaw learned that the driver had never made it home. On the way back to the brewery, his van had swerved off the road and the driver had been pronounced dead on the scene. Like, that was enough. This is too weird. He decided that he was done with it. Like, clearly, there was something going on with this chair. He donated it to the Thirsk Museum, where it was apparently transported under heavy security to make sure that no one sneaks a little sit down on the way there. So Earnshaw's only condition for donating it to the museum was that it would be attached five feet high on the wall and that no one would be able to sit in it again. And that's where it has lived since then, fixed to the wall in Thirsk Museum. Apparently, lots of people over the years have asked museum staff to take it down from the wall so that they could sit in it. Like seriously, like what is wrong with people? But the museum have honored the promise that they made with Tony Earnshaw and refused to let anyone sit in the chair since. It seems that removing the chair from the inn didn't stop the ghostly goings on at the Busby Stoop Inn though. One landlord who ran the pub after the chair had already moved to the first museum had said that he had had nothing but bad luck since moving into the place. Apparently every morning he'd like come down into the bar and find it just like a complete state. Like beer taps would be running, pint glasses smashed everywhere and things moved about in the night that with absolutely no explanation. According to the landlord, the only thing that stopped this pretty inconvenient poltergeist activity and the string of bad luck was stoking up the fire and leaving a pint out every evening as an offering to Thomas Busby's spirit close to where he would have sat at the bar. Which then like you think about it, it makes sense. Like Thomas Busby, if he was haunting that place, he'd be like, guys, where's my chair? I'm gonna start smashing glasses if you don't tell me where my chair is right now. Like. It all makes sense, right? So some newspapers have claimed that the total body count of the Busby Stoop chair is as high as 63 people, but there's actually no record of where this number has come from. There was an American newspaper called the Weekly World News that reported on the curse of the Busby Stoop chair, but its dates were like all over the place and it just wasn't accurate. So it was probably just a sensationalized story for the readers. So let's address the glaring hole in this story. Like realistically, like looking at a photo of the chair it does not look like a chair from the late 1600s, early 1700s. And there's even been like a furniture historian claim that the spindles that like make up the back look like they were produced by a machine, which would have been from about 1840 at least. So that's almost 140 years after Thomas was executed. So it could have been that the chair was swapped at the museum, like they still wanted to exhibit something to keep the legend alive, but not actually wanting the chair on display and ending up with a bunch of deaths maybe. Or maybe Tony Earnshaw donated a different chair while keeping the original like locked away or maybe even destroyed. There's just no way to know or verify the actual chair, which just adds a bit more to the whole mystery of the story, doesn't it? Even so, I still wouldn't go around touching the chair in the Thirsk Museum. Danity Hall, where the brutal murder took place, is still standing to this day, although this and the surrounding woods where Daniel's body was found is now private farmland. The inn is also still standing today, although now it's an Indian restaurant that's been renamed. There's like, there's no reference to Busby anymore because like when you think about it like other than a couple of farm buildings and a garage the inn stood alone on the a61 like there was weren't really any houses around it so before drink driving laws and probably more specifically the breathalyzer the inn would have been in the perfect position to catch passing traffic like traveling into or out of thirsk so like if a traveler wanted a road beer you've got a pub there 
But once it became illegal to have a road beer or 10, it was pretty much doomed and poured its final pint as the Busby Stoop Inn in 2012. Because unless you were taking a specific trip out there with a designated driver, like you wouldn't really bother. But even with the chair securely fixed high on a wall in a museum and all references of the story removed from the inn, that doesn't stop people continuing to pass on the legend and refer to the Busby Stoop chair as one of the most haunted and cursed objects in the world. But what do you think? Did you ever visit the Busby Stoop Inn or the Thirsk Museum? Do you have any stories to tell? Please let me know your thoughts down below. I absolutely love reading other people's ghostly experiences and stories. I think for me, it's difficult to say, like, we know that the story of Thomas Busby is true. Like, it actually happened. There are records of the crime and all of that. But then I think it has gone the way in a lot of legends. It gets embellished and distorted and it's passed down through word of mouth. Maybe it was cursed or maybe people shouldn't be drinking and driving or going back to work on dangerous construction sites, you know? But you never really know with these things and I would err on the side of caution and not risk it. But let me know. If you enjoyed this story, I would be so incredibly grateful if you would hit the like button and I would love to see you back here for another story sometime. So maybe if you fancied it too, then you might wanna subscribe. And if there are any like haunted objects or stories that you would like me to cover, please let me know. I am always up for learning more about other spooky ooky things. But that is all from me today. I cannot wait to chat with you more tomorrow. Have a great day. And until next time, sleep safe. So we have so much that you are going to want to miss. 